So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our online program uh, live from uh, New York, uh, Dusan Neumann. I saw it happen uh, Prague, August uh, 1968. The Czech Center at the Bohemian National Hall still remains closed. Uh, we hope that not uh, for too much longer. And this is the reason we continue with our programming via Zoom videos, uh, our uh, newsletter, website uh, www.checkcenter.com and also on social media. We always meet around August 21st to remind ourselves uh, what happened during the summer of 1968 in Czechoslovakia. It brought the tragic end of the Prague Spring, an attempt to reform the communist regime in Czechoslovakia of so-called socialism with a human face resulted in the tragic occupation of Czechoslovakia by other Warsaw Pact um, countries uh, 52 years ago. It led to the establishment of a hard, oppressive, aggressive regime of so-called normalization. Dusan Neumann, then um, a young 23-year-old journalist in training at the Czech radio, spent the spring of summer of 1968 in Prague. During the early morning of August 21st, 1968, he started not only to record his story in the making on his camera, but also coming to the decision that he didn't want to live uh, in an occupied totalitarian country. Like many others, he left uh, later for the West and uh, spent most of his life here in uh, the United States. Now he lives in Pottsville, Pennsylvania, uh, but right now he's joining us from Prague. Dusan Neumann uh, was fired from the Czech TV in 19, uh, 1970 for political reasons and emigrated to the US in 1980. Since the Velvet Revolution, he has worked for the Czech radio, Czech television, and other news media reporting on what's happening in the United States. And now he divides his time between Pennsylvania and Czech Republic. It is now already a couple minutes after midnight in Prague. So hello, Dushan, are you there? Yes, I am. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, New York. Before we get to enjoy uh, your photos uh, with your commentary, please tell us more about you and how you yourself experienced uh, this tragic historical event and how did it affect uh, you personally? Well, I must say the evening before, that means on the, the 20th of the August, I and my two sisters, we enjoyed the uh, part spent in the Prague because my parents, uh, my father that time served in the army, suddenly were invited to Poland, which uh, later showed up and they were interned because my father was also considered as an unreliable ally of the Soviet. But anyway, so we had a long, long evening and uh, in the open window, we just heard the planes arriving uh, in a such pace which we were not accustomed and if also uh, if they were not uh, jet planes they were uh, the uh, Russian AN-24 turbo prop jet so it was strange and in that moment my friend called me on the telephone and said Russians are coming turn the radio on so we did and uh, just big surprise and we waited didn't know really what to do but uh, I was very intrigued, so I picked up my camera, which by coincidence was the Soviet made Zenith 3 n and around the five o'clock morning, I left the apartment and went to uh, the big square in the Prague 6, where the, uh, the military headquarters of the Czechoslovak army was. And then uh, over there, I started recording the events of the day and the next uh, next few days of the occupation. Uh, thank you, Dushan. So uh, we would like to encourage viewers to write their questions for Dushan into the group chat in the button uh, panel. Uh, he will answer your question after his talk. And now, Dushan, please take us through your photos that uh, captured the fateful day of uh, August 21st, 1968. Well, this is the 
picture of the first Soviet tank going directly down to the army headquarters and to downtown on the Prague from the direction of the Prague airport. At that time, nobody really knew what was going on and the people were going to the work. You can see that the trolley car was still on the tracks, but the drivers of the cars took the left lane, I mean the opposite direction because the rumbling monster of the T-55 was already occupied the right lane were going down to the Prague. And it was very ominous view. And actually it was my first picture I took. So the next pictures are a little bit farther. On the square right in front of the, uh, the building of the uh, general staff of the Czechoslovak army, the group of the Soviet vehicles, uh, Jeeps and the black Volga cars dislodged some Soviet officers. They smiling discussed the event because they didn't meet any armed resistance, which uh, probably was some surprise for them. Uh, later, I learned that the tall officer facing in this picture it was the General Pavlovsky, who was uh, the commander of this particular part of the invasion to the downtown side. Next, please. Hello. Yeah. Uh, of course, the spearhead of the uh, Soviet army, not just not the Soviet army, by the Warsaw Pact armies, were uh, the light armored vehicles that were transported by the Soviet uh, cargo transportation planes, and they were the first ones that occupied the, uh, I would say, the most important intersections and the building in the Prague. I must say that the Soviets uh, had a joint exercise with the Czechoslovak army uh, two months before the occupation. So they mapped exactly the key uh, points in the Prague uh, that they had to occupy first actually to prevent any kind of the uprising or the military response from the Czechoslovak side. Next, please. Among the uh, first the units were the paratroopers of the Soviet army. And as we can see, they were all from the Asian part of the Soviet Union. And these guys, they really didn't know where they were. Some of them even saw they were in the West Germany. And again, they are riding on those um, uh, aero liftable armored uh, vehicles. Uh, we tried to, we tried to uh, intervene and the talk to them, but in vain. In most of these guys even didn't speak good Russian. Next, please. From the uh, Victory Square, I tried to go to the castle, which is just about the uh, um, about a half a mile north, uh, no, south of the uh, Victory Square. And when I when I reached that point, I was walking or running back then. I was still young, so I could run even up the hill. Uh, I already found the castle, which is also the seat of the president of uh, Czechoslovakia and today of Czech Republic occupied by the Soviet unit. Uh, this moment was the, probably one of the scariest of the day because when I pointed my camera on those two soldiers, they just aimed the uh, submachine guns uh, right uh, against me. So uh, I didn't take more pictures, just this one and, uh, and left. Uh, so next please. I tried to go to uh, the school to the School of Journalism and Sociology, which I was studying over the hill at Letna. And under the hill is the seat of the government. And the seat of the government of all of this, you can see in the details, surrounded by the Russian tanks and armored carriers with the barrels of their uh, 100 millimeter guns uh, pointed to the windows of the Czechoslovak government. It was sort of very ominous note 
what is going to happen next. And we really were, were not sure uh, how violent this occupation can get. So um, from here, I went down to, uh, my, uh, to the school where we got with my friends also generally some other equipment, the 60 millimeters cameras, more film. And from there, we tried to go to uh, Czechos Czechoslovak radio because that was the point of the interest because the Russians, they wanted to shut down any communication that the uh, besieged the Czechoslovak government would have. Next, please. <clears throat> so when I saw the tanks uh, pointing at the government buildings, I tried to make a little leave, a, a little detour, return back to the main uh, street going, uh, going close uh, to uh, the downtown, uh, which actually was one of the largest and actually the cobblestone paved back then. And when I read that, the uh, tanks were coming already from the other side of the Prague, which meant that the Prague was completely surrounded. And those tanks were coming probably from the East Germany. I must say there were no East German tanks because the Russians really didn't want uh, the nation that still had the bad memories of World War II to be exposed to another German liberation. So all these tanks were Russian, and on the north of the Republic, they came from the Poland to Slovakia from the Hungary. But most of the tanks and most of the equipment was actually Russian. Next, please. This is sort of the historic ironic place. This is on the place that's called in the Klaros, in the Prague, and that Soviet tank is standing very close very close to the point or to the place where at the morning 9th of, of May 1945, the only Russian tank destroyed by the Nazis in the Prague was hit by the Panzerfaust. This time it was liberating tank which was about as hostile as bad those German tanks were before. Uh, next please. Uh, the closer we get to the Czech radio, we found that the people of the Prague trying to build the barricades. They used the trolley cars, uh, buses, uh, cobblestones, whatever they could. But of course, these uh, you know, impromptu made barricades were no match for a Russian. But some brave guys uh, used the picks, uh, they punctured the spare barrels of the uh, diesel fuel that tanks carried on the back and lit them up. Uh, this tank, which you can see actually is, uh, that rolled over the ambulance car. Fortunately, nobody was killed in that one, but as they rolled over the car that ignited and the, uh, the, the diesel fuel pouring of those open spare tanks in the back of the tank were lit and this tank close to the Czechoslovak radio was one of the few that were actually destroyed during the day of the August 23rd. Next, please. This is the another picture of that burning tank. Uh, as the tank was burning, the uh, Soviet uh, soldiers that were on the armored carriers they panicked and they started to shoot around the buildings. So a lot of buildings were damaged. Uh, you could see the bullet holes in the plaster of those buildings for next 10, maybe even 20 years, especially on the National Museum, which just recently was repaired. But those marks, those poke marks of the Russian bullets are still visible. Uh, in this place, unfortunately, some of the of the defenders, or I would say so-called unarmed defenders, were uh, harmed and a uh, few people were killed. Next, please. Uh, as um, <clears throat> uh, the people still couldn't believe what was happening, so some uh, in the aisle were, were looking on it. But when the bullets started to fly, they all hit the ground over there. And I must say, that was the probably most curious, curious uh, a, a feeling in my, in my life that time, 
when uh, the Russian machine gun was uh, was just the uh, nibbling in the plaster, probably a meter above my head, and the broken plaster was falling on me. So I, at that moment, I didn't uh, dare to lift my, raise my head and take the pictures of that. Next, please. Yeah, this is still that burning, some of the burning barricades, some of the cars that were destroyed. So you can see. Uh, this is later that day uh, when finally the, um, the fires were put down and the people were going to, you can see uh, to the Czechoslovak radio, which is in the short distance on the right side behind the destroyed trolley cars, which were dislodged and derailed, and derailed from the cars. But at that moment, after the violent encounter with the fires and the machine gunning and uh, some buildings, um, buildings um, up to the street were still smoldering, uh, the Russians uh, got the order and they pulled back from that particular point. Uh, what we didn't know that the Russian paratroopers entered the building of the Czech radio and were already cleaning it up. Next, please. Um, yeah, this is a <clears throat> picture from the other side. A broken car. This is you. You can see that I, I put this picture there only because uh, because the uh, uh, the tension of the moment and uh, uh, I was uh, I was probably pretty well badly shaken. So the picture is not really too sharp, too focused, and it just more um, is more testimony about my condition than about the condition of the street. Next, please. And this is in the street Itzalska, which is a street that crosses the main street in Ohrabska. It's still the radio, uh, building of the radio is in the block next to here. And that was the another approach to radio, which people barricaded with the city buses. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, uh, you can see, uh, the Russians just broke through, uh, burned those, uh, burned those uh, buses and uh, broke through the barricades. But what they couldn't, did not uh, break and were not able to break was the spirit of the Czech people who actually formed a big crowd. And I must say the, the, the Russians uh, really didn't want problem, uh, to run the tanks through the people uh, because as I say, they probably expected the military response and there was none. That was just the civil and just the fist above the heads, you know, um, showing the Russians the disagreement and disappointment and just the rage against the occupants. Next, please. This is the last picture of the Czechoslovak radio uh, with the reporter still on the balcony. That was after, as you can see, after the, uh, the machine gunning, gunning on the street. And in this moment, the re reporters went down on the balcony and warned the people not to resist violently, uh, despair, you know, that you, your lives are more of more value than the, uh, the the bravery which would lead just to your death. Uh, very few moments after these gentlemen um, talked to the to the crowd, they had to leave because the Russians were already in the building, and the reporters uh, left and come to the underground, some at the different the windows, and within the few hours after the Russians shut down the main Czechoslovak radio building, uh, the auxiliary uh, transmitter started to broadcast from the different places in the Czechoslovakia 
and they were broadcasting all the time in those first days and the Russians were not able to really shut the, 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 the main channels of the communication down. That was a very, I would say, brave and very technically complex uh, achievement of the, the technicians of the Czechoslovak radio and the brave reporters who, who pursued all the time, 24 hours a day, uh, their work, especially just to warning people, do not resist because uh, the Russian invasion or a Warsaw Pact is so overwhelming. Yeah, they, uh, um, it, it's, I don't know exactly the numbers, but over a thousand tanks came in and uh, it, it was just so overwhelming that the resistance was really futile. Next, please. This is the only picture that I didn't take. Uh, by the coincidence, my future brother-in-law came to the same place and he took the picture of me, so I'm, I'm just here boasting a little bit. That's me who's in, in the wreckage here taking the picture. Uh, unfortunately, only few pictures from, not a few, but actually the 25 about pictures I could find after I returned from, uh, from the exile first time. I had a few roles and they all disappeared in the course of the years of normalization. Next, please. This is another picture of the one of the barricades that was rolled over by the Russian tanks. What you can see on the right side, the flattened things, that was a city bus. Behind it, there were some uh, concrete mixtures. They were more difficult to crush, but still, they were no match for the advancing Soviet tanks. This is, of course, of the, the mass, uh, you know, aftermath when the radio was already occupied and people were just uh, standing there in the aisles looking what was going on and uh, slowly leaving, slowly leaving because it was a later afternoon and uh, some different uh, sets of the moods were coming on. Next, please. This is the old town hall square in the Prague, uh, which is a very historical place. And as you can see, uh, right in front of the statue of John Hus, who is a national uh, a symbol of the national fight for truth and, uh, and the sacrifice, is the Soviet anti-aircraft twin barrel 20 millimeter gun. And some people or some students, they climbed on the statue. It's not that distinct in this picture, but they put, uh, they blinded with the scarf, the eyes of the John Hus that he couldn't see the devastation and the, and the death of, of the liber, uh, liberty and the freedom in Czechoslovakia. Next please. Immediately on the streets and just everywhere in the shopping windows, the numerous uh, leaflets, pictures, uh, proclamations in the improvised improvised boards were placed, uh, it, which was actually was um, they were intended to keep the moral of the people up. Uh, at that time, uh, some, even some of us, uh, sort of believed that the occupation will be short-lived, that the government that was kidnapped and uh, lifted to uh, Moscow will be able to negotiate some kind of the compromise, which, uh, of course, was a very false uh, very expectation. Next, please. This is on that place on the Letna, which is very large, large open space on the uh, uh, northern part of the Prague, which uh, became an improvised airport for Russian 
uh, choppers and the Russian tanks. And as you can see, some people who uh, started to think about their families, like this man, were already uh, running to the shops and uh, getting the supplies because nobody knew what will happen with the supplies of the food, water, and sanitary, and everything else. Because the country was completely shut down. Uh, you know, there, there was no... Uh, no, nobody really knew if any shops would open, and so the people started to resupply their um, their groceries and all all of the the, 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 the um, things they need for their living. Next, please. And this was a very symbolic picture, and that's the only picture which is not was not taken on August 23rd, but a few days later um, on the Victoria Square, where the picture that I call the future of our children in the shadow of the Soviet tank, under the building there in the Cyrillic are Ward Swoboda and the Dubček, who was the president and the um, secretary, first secretary of the Communist Party, as a symbol, symbol of the free Czechoslovakia, which then we recalled was aiming for uh, socialism with the, with the human face, which of course was also a sort of foolish idea. And that's about it. I think it's the last picture, and uh, I'm giving. Thank you, thank you, Dušan. Thank you, Dušan. Um, uh, that was uh, really amazing to hear. Uh, not because we have never seen uh, similar pictures before, but because uh, it's your personal account of what happened. Uh, it's been more than 50 years uh, since uh, the fateful day, but uh, for many of us, it's like uh, it was yesterday. Uh, everyone who is now uh, over 60 years old remembers clearly where uh, they were uh, when uh, the occupation took place. I was five years old, I remember just a little bit. So now we will look to some questions from the audience and we encourage viewers to write uh, your questions in the chat um, uh, group chat. And uh, before uh, we do that, first I would like to ask uh, you how your friends reacted back then and later uh, on when the normalization started and many people were suddenly confronted with uh, a new reality. Well, the first week, we really didn't, uh, the first week was total confusion, total confusion. Uh, later, after the government returned from Moscow, we realized that the, the treasure was such that only uh, Dr. Kriegel was the only person who opposed the, uh, the, the Russian pressure and he didn't sign the document. It was the virtual capitulation to the uh, free development uh, of the Czechoslovakia as a sort of uh, Yugoslav economic model, which uh, we thought would be suitable back then. Uh, next year, <clears throat> the whole year was the year uh, of the still uh, some kind of the resistance, uh, which was the end of the uh, mark by the, by the um, self-sacrifice of Jan Palak. And what was the first, I would say, really really bad sign that it's all over for us was the first anniversary in uh, 1969 in the August 21st because back then the the forces who were uh, who were the, uh, attacking the protesters and demonstrators were the Czech police and Czech uh, what they call the uh, the people's militia which was sort of like the communist uh, communist party SA, and then we knew it was all over because they were not Russians who were beating us, executing at us. They were the Czech forces. And uh, Is there... still, we thought that the uh, occupation might take, let's say, four or five years. We gave ourselves 
So I, <clears throat> I already had a chance to, to defect, and I was in 1969 in Paris. I, I got a, I got opportunity to stay there and with the uh, father figure CDSP, but my sisters and my parents asked me to come back because they were afraid that they would be kicked out of the school and of the employment of the jobs and so and so. So I returned and it took me another gun, then, you know, the passport was confiscated and all, all what we know what is going on. So it took me virtually 10 years before I was able to leave which I did. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a the question if um, you already mentioned that a little bit, uh, was there any effort during and after the invasion to locate and confiscate the photos or firms, uh, films from the events? Uh, not mine, <clears throat> but of course, uh, a lot of it, a lot of those, uh, those films were, uh, that were made by the uh, short film or um, by the professional filmmakers, uh, they were confiscated, yes, I believe. But unfortunately, uh, most of it, I would say, surprisingly, a lot of it appeared after the uh, uh, 1989, and quite good documentaries were edited from those pictures. And of course, the, the, the best coverage was by the uh, Mr. Kodalka, who covered much more and preserve much more rows of the films than I did. So the Czech radio, uh, you played an important role in 1945, 1968, 1989. Uh, so uh, we saw uh, pictures. So were the reporters of the occupied uh, Czech radio building communicating with the protesters on the street in front of the building? What was the atmosphere? Uh, between the people inside the radio and outside? Well, the inside radio, I would say uh, the, uh, uh, the main concern was where to move, where the place, uh, to what place that would be safe and would have enough technical equipment that would be safe from different local radios, regional radios, whatever, that the broadcasting could continue. Not all of the reporters were able to reach such places because uh, they, most of them moved from the Prague. I know that somewhere in the Czech Republic and other locations, uh, some broadcasting was done from the uh, factories making the electronics. You know. uh, that, that was amazing because <laughs> uh, before, before the occupation, uh, the Czech television, had the one and a half programs and the three days after the occupation, there were more channels running, different programs, very short ones, uh, than, uh, than the socialist government before was able to do in the five years. Mm -hmm. So what uh, happened is, uh, when uh, did you first uh, develop these photos, the film rolls, and when uh, could you first show them in public? Well, actually, the first I um, brought them to school, I was still, uh, you know, studying. I still had two years to finish. Uh, well, actually, yeah, almost two years, not my full two. So I, I actually, to some of my uh, fellow, we exchanged it. Uh, uh, back then, even some films, uh, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the Vladimir Zelezny, who was my schoolmate, he had a 16 millimeter camera and he recorded some film. So we, sh we have seen some of that, but there was no place um, later in any Czech media that, uh, that would print them. Actually two of my pictures, and it was the pictures of the two soldiers uh, aiming the weapons at me and the picture of the, the, the baby playing in front of the Russian tanks uh, were printed in the German magazine Stern. Mm -hmm. So do you know uh, someone who was punished for taking these pictures? You, you mentioned uh, Mr. Zelazny. Not, not, you know, that somebody would be punished to like to send to the prison or whatever. But <clears throat> whenever the STB or secret police or the employer who changed, you know, the uh, 
the management in the most of the newspapers ch changed. Uh, is, so the, the archives of the printers in those newspapers were um, probably confiscated or became the, the you know liberty prohibited. So they were never never shown in the official uh, Czech media in the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I was uh, director of the American Center in Prague, we had a chance to display your um, uh, photos, I think, for the first time in uh, the Czech Republic. And uh, later on, uh, the same exhibition, I think, was also in the United States. Why uh, you have waited so long to, to show uh, your pictures? Because we are now 30 years after the Velvet Revolution, where we can show whatever we want. Well, it was it was very simple. Uh, after my father um, died, uh, we went in a, in the, my parents' house, you know, to the the Ramek and everything else, and I found the shoebox with the negatives. And so it it was, you know, in um, 1999, and then I had to scan them, and so I didn't do so. That was how I found them. Mm -hmm. I uh, never thought that they would survive, you know, they were uh, up in the attic in the shoebox. Mm -hmm. So every year when uh, 21st of August um, approaches, what, uh, you know, is going through your mind? Is there something you always will remember? <clears throat> oh yeah, there is always remember. Uh, the clatter of the machine gun nibbling the plaster above my head, that's something that never can leave you. Uh, but I must say that those accurate memories are fading, fading away. I remember when I was a boy and I listened to my grandparents and the uncles who went through the World War I and then World War II. And suddenly I realized today that when they talked about this event, they were only 35 years at the, ago at that moment when we were talking now and now we are 50 years now so as my generation is aging and departing this world of unfortunately those memories will fade away with us and uh, for the next generation they will become mixed with the um, memories of the world war one world war II, uh, probably with the Hussite wars and, and who knows on the one side, I think it's good that nobody has a fear anymore that the Soviet invasion would happen again. On the other side, um, the men, you know, history lost is, uh, is the history that would happen again. So it's sort of contradictory feeling. So, so right now you are uh, in Prague or near Prague. So, um, and uh, you know, you are following the, the media and, uh, and, and you are talking to the people in, in hospodas, in pubs. So uh, do you think that, uh, you know, uh, the 1968 is uh, still uh, remembered? Yes, it is still remembered, but it's not as intensive as it was. Till ten years ago, or when it was, you know, the uh, the round anniversary, when it was the fiftieth anniversary, it was a large in Prague. Uh, you know, they were the, uh, on the street. There, there were uh, the exhibits of the different pages. I had a summer also in the David's on the street uh, this year, and of course the uh, COVID nineteen has something to do with it. So it sort of came this year. Uh, on the, even in the radio, we don't hear much except a lot of Karel Krill's uh, uh, songs and uh, very short uh, reminders in the, in, in the news. But the, it, it's nothing like it was, you know, just after 1989. Uh, thank you, Lucian, uh, very much for uh, sharing your story. Uh, we don't have any more uh, questions, uh, but we have a good news that uh, you can see all of these pictures, um, you know, on our website, uh, checkcenter.com. This uh, was Dusan Neumann, Czech American journalist uh, with his uh, unique uh, collection of uh, 21 photographs from August 21st, 1968.
Mr. Neumann was so nice uh, that he agreed to publish these pictures also on our website. Uh, there you can also find out about our upcoming uh, programs. Uh, please uh, subscribe to our newsletter on our uh, web to keep up uh, to date with our upcoming events. In